the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we're going to be talking to Catherine Bertine. And Catherine has done so much stuff. It's unbelievable. She is an athlete. She's an author. She's an activist, a filmmaker, and a public speaker. There are so many different topics of conversation that we can talk about. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to discuss during this podcast. Catherine, how are you? Hi, Sarah. I'm well, thank you. And thanks for that kind introduction. Oh, you're welcome. Do you just want to quickly maybe introduce yourself and tell me just a little bit more about you and your background? (laughs) I think you did a better job of that than I could. I'm I'm often scattered as to which side of of my persona, you know, is is best to introduce. But um, I guess I will say that I, I identify most as an athlete and an activist and a writer. And those are the three main facets of my life. And I've been in a place in the past few years where I've been able to combine all three of those elements. So uh, even though sometimes I feel unclassifiable in terms of what I am or who, you know, who I am, (laughs) those would be the main three facets. Awesome. Let's just start with the first one, the athlete. How did it all start for you? Have you always been very sporty as you were growing up? Yes. Um, so it started when I was a kid. I, I was just, just as you said, sporty growing up. And I grew up in New York as a figure skater primarily. And then after college, I came to Tucson, Arizona to pursue my graduate studies in, in writing. And when I came out to Tucson, there was no ice. <laughs> and uh, I decided, you know, okay, I need a, a new sport, something that I can do out here as, as an outlet. And that's when I found triathlon. And I was in the sport of triathlon for about nine years. And then I segued over into the world of road cycling as the cycling was the best and strongest part of my triathlon career. So I began dabbling in road cycling in 2007. And I picked it up quote unquote late. Uh, I was 31 when I first got on a road bike and I, I just recently turned 40. And, you know, at 31 people were saying, oh, well, that's great. Good for you. You know, I'm sure you'll enjoy the sport, but you know, nobody really had any expectation of me trying to turn professional or seeing how far I could go in the sport. So, uh, you know, about five years later, when I was 36, I was able to land my first professional contract as a road cyclist. And that brought me on, I guess, the journey where we are today in terms of the activism and the writing for the past few years. That's absolutely fantastic. So so let's just take it uh, back to when you were 31 and you decided road cycling, that's, you know, or cycling was what you were strongest at. When you were that age, did you was your goal to turn professional or was it still very much hobby based? Yeah. So not my, my goal to turn professional was not immediate. Actually. It's pretty funny. I was working for a sports site called ESPN, which is big here in America. And ESPN gave me the challenge of seeing if I could get to the Olympic games in two years, this would have been for the 2008 Olympic games. And they said, we want you to write about yourself, go pick a sport and try it. <laughs> and it, so my cycling career started as a journalism assignment, which is very bizarre. But what's even funnier is that when the assignment ended, and I will give away the, the ending here that I, I did not make the 2008 Olympic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a really good thing too, you know, because no athlete really should be making the Olympics after just... 24 months, you know, of of being in a sport. So I was able to show the world how hard cycling was or is, I should say. But what happened was when the assignment ended, by that point, I'd been cycling for two years and I was so hooked on, you know, a personal love for the sport. It had nothing to do with journalism anymore. Now I was just all in and I wanted to turn professional. So at that point I was 33 and I said, okay, I want to see if I can get to that pro level. And if you recall, this was at a time when there was an age limit imposed on teams uh, where the average age could not go over 28 at the highest ranking of the professional level. And it was a, a terrible rule, an arcane rule that didn't do any justice for anybody, especially in endurance sports um, on the women's side. But luckily that rule has been lifted. But at the time, 
trying to be a 33 year old professional athlete was, you know, people just kind of smiled and said, yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I just want to take you back, actually. What an amazing assignment from ESPN. So, you know, you've got two years, go out and see if you can make it to the Olympic Games and just trying out all of these different sports. What sort of sports were you trying? Were you trying everything across the board or how did you pick them out? Great question. So I can tell you the short answer is I chronicled the entire journey in a first it was a web series called So You Want to Be an Olympian, and then it was turned into a book called As Good as Gold. So you can read the whole story there, but the short story is I first tried these quote unquote fringe sports that, you know, every country has sports that it, it it excels at or it has a you know a tradition in. And then every country has sports that they don't play or they, you know, it's not a leading sport. So I thought that maybe the first thing I would do would try maybe five or six sports that we in America don't usually have access to. And I thought, oh, maybe these sports will be easier. And of course they weren't because they're they're giant popular sports everywhere else. So um, some of the sports were Modern pentathlon, open water swimming, team handball. They at first ESPN said try the luge, and I said, well, that's very difficult because that's not in the Summer Olympics. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, don't stack the odds against me that much. (laughs) But that must have been like an awesome experience, though. Just uh, even just getting out there, meeting all these different professionals, and seeing how committed they are to their individual sports. Oh yes, it was it was wonderful, and that was the real idea for me to convey as a journalist was not trying to barge into these sports and think that I was really good or I knew what I was doing. You know, it was the opposite. It was, it was to find these sports and celebrate how good these athletes are at the top of their game in these sports that we've not heard of. So what, um, what would be like a highlight from, from that whole experience? Is there a particular memory that stands out either, you know, a success or a failure or just something that sticks in your memory or, or some, a learning experience? Yeah, let's see. So one of the the stories that comes to mind is trying to master the modern pentathlon, which is running, swimming, shooting, fencing, and horseback riding. And to think that I could do even one of those, let alone five, (laughs) was something else. You know, and here I am showing up at the Olympic Training Center to jump in like a trial camp and talk to the best of the best and these athletes were phenomenal and they were very encouraging trying to show me the way you know especially uh say fencing which which is so skill oriented and something that most people in that sport have been doing since a young age so you know trying to teach a clumsy 31 year old how to do it was was crazy and i i feel you know very fortunate that i got the opportunity to try any of the sports and meet those people um and then i you know for a different story, let's say trying open water swimming. I did a race in Australia, a, an 11 kilometer open water swim. And here I am, you know, coming out of triathlon. I know how to swim. I know how to, you know, be an endurance athlete, but something about being in the ocean for, you know, nearly three hours in the middle of Australia, swimming through jellyfish. And I won't even let my mind to this day say shark infested waters. <laughs> we all know, we all know what swims around down there. <laughs> so, you know, these are the, uh, the, the stories I, I feel so fortunate to look back and say, oh my gosh, I, you know, I can't believe I had the opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Oh, I'm definitely putting the link into your book so people can go and read all about that because it sounds fantastic. Oh, thank you. So you also mentioned that you got hooked on road cycling and you just found this this love for the sport. Can you try and explain what it is about the sport that just got you so hooked and why people should go out and try it? Yeah, yeah. So it was so road cycling is so different than triathlon cycling. Because in triathlon, what you have to do is you have to go from point A to point B and really go your own pace. You know, it's usually non-draft legal. And the whole idea is you're saving yourself, you know, for the run, but going as fast as you can on the bike. And then you get over to road cycling and all of a sudden it's like a physical and mental chess game. You know, there are team tactics. There's uh, sometimes you're going really, really fast in the peloton. Other times it slows down and tactics are being employed. And 
uh, the varied terrain. You know, it was so interesting to me that every bike race was different. It had a different outcome. It had a different strategy. It had just different everything. And that was intriguing to me. And I, I think people who find their way into the sport of cycling, you know, are kind of smitten by that element of, of surprise. And that was, that, that's one of the great things too. And you know what I also love about road cycling is you see so many different strengths and body types in the sport. You can be a larger physical athlete, uh, you know, and specialize in sprinting and be really, really strong and solid. You can be a tiny little climber. You can be a, you know, a time trialist who spans all sorts of, of heights and weight ratios. So it, it was so interesting t- for me to actually look out amongst my competitors and see all these different body types thriving and succeeding. And I, I love that. Absolutely. I love what you said about it being like a physical and mental game and that it's actually quite tactical. So you mentioned, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, the peloton. Is that right? Oh, good. Uh, So you mentioned the peloton. Can you just describe what the peloton is and how it works? And and for somebody who's maybe they might have seen it on the Tour de France, but they're not sort of 100% sure what what it is. How would you sort of best describe that? Right. So the peloton, that's our word for the large group of cyclists moving in one mass. It kind of looks like an amoeba, right? (laughs) Going down the road, brightly colored amoeba. That is what we call the peloton. It's the group, basically. And it's all the teams and all the riders mixed together. And the way what happens is individuals will break free from the peloton to go up the road to try to get their teammates up ahead, you know, because somebody has to win. (laughs) So you have some teammates going up the road, kind of calling the bluff of the peloton behind them saying, hey, are you going to chase me or not? Are you going to chase me right now? Are you going to wait till later in the race? Or, you know, maybe some of the teammates are employed as what we call domestiques, which is a word, uh, the French word for servant. And basically the domestiques go out there and try to instigate the race to happen. And they use all their energy in the beginning of the race or the middle of the race so that their team leader can kind of sit in the peloton and maybe save her legs for the ultimate climb or the ultimate sprint at the end. So those are some of the tactics that we talk about when we talk about, um, you know, the peloton. What's the peloton going to do? How is it moving? So that is the main the main gist of it. The peloton is the big chunk of riders, and then riders up ahead would be called the breakaway. Riders that are kind of back away behind the peloton, they're just having a bad day. Those are riders who have broken off and, or fallen off the peloton, we, we say. So that's a little bit of the overview of it. And then once you watch the sport of cycling, you, um, you, know, you can pick up on that. And the announcers do a pretty good job of trying to educate as, as the race is going forward. So when it comes to, there's, there's different elements with road racing, such as the mountains and climbing up these mountains, especially I know when I watched the Tour de France, you know, these, these, these mountains are just huge and so steep and you can be climbing for hours. What are your tactics for when you face a massive mountain climb? Well, I think, um, and, and that's always, that's always part of the game, right? Is to figure out what those tactics are on a climb. It's almost always going to come down to the individual strength of a rider, there's very little that one rider can do for another if uh, you know if they don't have a matched strength physically. So usually, what happens is the peloton will do everything they can to get their rider to the base of the climb safely and saving as much energy as possible. And then when the riders are when the you know key climbers of the team are on the climb, it's their job to just go at the highest yet most sustainable pace that they can handle. Because, you know, there's really no recovery once you, we use the term blow up, you know, for when you, you've spent everything you have. And, and once you blow up, you know, there's really no coming back from that. Uh, you don't get two or three chances to, you know, sprint up a mountain. It's so you have to know your physical ability and know how much you can suffer and how many watts you can put out. So it's, it's a calculated risk, I suppose, when it comes down to the climb. Now, you've obviously raced sort of all over the world from the Caribbean to to over in Europe. Is there a particular race that stands out for you? Oh, yeah. I suppose suppose my answer for that is 
one, collectively, I've loved the entire journey of it. And every place I race has something amazing to remember, something great to offer the memory storage, you know? (laughs) So I love everywhere that I race. But I would say for me, I guess the biggest achievement that I was able to to help create in this sport was getting the the one-day event La Course by Tour de France to happen um, at the Tour de France. So the women racing on the Champs-Élysées, the last day of of the Tour de France, that was a memory and a moment that I'll never forget. And that was, you know, July of 2014. And it remains to this day, a true highlight of not just my cycling career, but my life. So am I right in saying that women can't race in the Tour de France? Yes. But to go back a little bit, the now the women have this one day event. And what we're trying to do is build that out and make sure that the race organizers are are being progressive and being forward thinking by adding more stages in the future, right? So, can it was I, a, can yeah. I always take you back just uh, just a step because this yeah. is going to sound ridiculous, but I almost didn't. It's only now when I think about it that I've realized that actually, yeah. The, can you explain why women <laughs> aren't allowed to race in the Tour de France? Because it just seems ridiculous that that even <laughs> that that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny. I can explain it, but at the same time, I can't explain it because it's just so so silly. Basically, the Tour de France is privately owned, right? That there is a race director that puts on that event, and so therefore, it's a privately owned event. So, by saying something like, uh, you know, well, why can't the women race it? It comes down to the owner of this particular event, and that's why why any business sets rules of what you can and cannot do. So uh, back in the 50s and even for a short time in the 80s, there were women that raced in the Tour de France, not for the full event, but for uh, partial days. And it went away. And when I was, you know, in the sport and kind of thinking along the lines of, of my investigative journalism side, as well as my rider side, I was asking that question too, saying, why, why aren't women here? I don't understand. Not only would it be very smart and financially lucrative for all parties, but it's also women are geared toward endurance. We'd probably do uh, a better job at a three week stage race than men's physiology. So, you know, I started thinking about that for years and from from that thought pattern and talking to other women is actually where, and I'm spurring off a little on a tangent here, but it's all related, I suppose, is where I decided that I wanted to make a documentary film about just that. Why are these archaic rules still prevalent in women's cycling? One of them, the biggest one being, why aren't women racing the Tour de France, especially when the women want to, and our level of competitiveness and expertise is top notch. You know, it's not like the women just picked up bikes yesterday. Like women's road racing has been in full force for for decades. So, we being many athletes voicing the same idea, but especially Emma Pooley of Great Britain and Chrissy Wellington, the world famous Ironman triathlete, and Marianne Vos and myself, we got together and wanted to change that. So, we formed a, a what we call a pressure group. And we lobbied both ASO and the UCI, which are the governing bodies and this and the organization that puts on the Tour de France to say, hey, it's time that the women are racing and we can prove to you that the people want to see women's racing. And we put out a petition and we got uh, over 100,000 signatures in, or almost 100,000 signatures in three weeks. And finally, ASO sat up and took notice and said, okay, well, you know, let's have a meeting about this. And from that meeting came the agreement that they would host a one day to kind of test the waters to see if, if the public would be okay with women's bike racing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) If, If people actually wanted to see it and what happened that day, you know, July 27th, 2014, when this race happened as planned was amazing. We had people flooding the streets of Paris we had all of the, you know, cable and internet sports stations reporting, and the numbers came back that yes, indeed, people do want to see women's racing at the highest level. So we've succeeded there, and now we're trying to put the pressure on them to say, okay, thank you very much for the last two years of the one-day race. Now we need to expand that. Now it's time to make it bigger. And uh, the only, you know, what we're coming up against is basically. ASO saying, well, we have to find the money and the time to do that. 
And we're all saying, okay, great. Let's help you do that. And they're saying, well, we'll get to it. <laughs> oh, God. So okay. believe, believe me, I am doing as much as I can from behind the scenes in terms of networking with potential sponsors and trying to keep the contact going so that it does happen. It's just tricky because, you know, the role of an activist, it almost needs to be full time. Yet at the same time, I have to live just like anybody else. And I'm, I'm also still racing my bike. So it's it's a tough one, you know, to, to try to change the world doesn't happen overnight. And so it's so great that we're making this progress. But I also have to be a little bit patient, too. Oh, do you know, that's one of my things that I don't have is this patience. It mm-hmm. actually, I started, it, it just really frustrates me so much about, about things like, you know, women and sponsorship and how, it, well, in the UK, women get 0.4% of the total sponsorship money. And it's yeah. sort of shocking to think, why are women not allowed in the Tour de France? Why aren't, why isn't it just open? And it's like, well, and you know, they, they drip feed you or there's no, you know, is the public interested in it? Oh, you know, it's the money, it's the time. And it's almost like giving you crumbs or we'll give you this one day event in 2014. We'll give you another one day event. And you know, you've always got to continue to be patient because you don't want to burn any bridges. But it gets to that point where you just want to take a sledgehammer to it and just be like, come on, <laughs> sort it out, people. Like, wake up. Hey. Well, I, so obviously the activism is, is hugely important and, and amazing what you've, um, you know, what you've achieved, even get, you know, getting the one day event in place. And what a fantastic moment that must have been for you to actually see all your hard work paying off. And you're obviously going to continue that. You, you know, you said you created a film about it. Yeah. yeah. Is, was that a film about the whole journey? Or can you just tell us a bit more about, about that film? Absolutely. So the film is actually available now for download internationally. It's called Half the Road, the passion, pitfalls, and power of women's professional cycling. And I really try to tout it. It's it's not just a film about cycling. It's really a film about equality, you know. And so hopefully, even if you're not a cyclist or you're not an athlete, we tried to make the film in a manner that would be really fun and interesting and educational for for everybody. So Anyone who gets fired up about inequity would hopefully like this, but you can check it out. We have halftheroad.com and it's, you can download it on Vimeo or iTunes or Amazon. It's all, it's all out there, (laughs) but the film itself really came from being in this, the world of journalism and being an athlete, a cyclist at the same time. And so as I was coming up through the sport, you know, I'm looking around at these races and I'm noticing the women aren't racing as long as the men, they're not racing. Racing. Uh, they're not getting the same paychecks at the professional level. They're not getting the same prize money at the amateur or professional level. And then we're always kind of billed second, like, oh, come check out the men's race at center stage, you know, and the women are kind of off in the corner of, oh, yeah, and they're racing too, you know. So I just kept thinking, why is it like this? And I had just come out of the sport of triathlon where the women race the same distances. They are competing on the same days as the men. They get the same prize money. It's all the same, right? And yet, um, it's important to note too, we weren't pushing to race against the men. We just want a women's field at every event, right? Just like triathlon, they're not, the women aren't technically racing the men. They have their own field. So the, the film really came about from exploring all of those, those questions and then branching out to my fellow riders and people in the industry who are, uh, you know, whether they're in the cycling industry or just in the world of, you know, politics or, or sponsorship, whatever it might be, and really reach out and get their, their take on why it is this way and involve other athletes, you know, so that is where Half the Road came from. And of course, the, the title Half the Road is a play on Half the, the Sky. Old- yeah, exactly. Half the sky. If we hold up half the sky, why aren't we getting our half of the road? And that, so that's what the film explores. And I also just on a very visual level wanted people to see female cyclists because, you know, this is a sport where you're wearing a helmet and glasses and you don't always get to see the athletes and get to know them as people. So it was really important for me that infused with the footage of some racing, we also got to see these women sitting down talking to the camera and you can see their their enthusiasm. And Emma Pooley, who is now a dear friend, but at the time, you know, just a, a competitor and colleague of mine. And wow, boy, does her personality shine in this film. She just is so fired up about, you know, changing the inequity 
that, I mean, she's a star of the film because <laughs> she's so passionate and that's what people relate to is, is that kind of passion. So. Absolutely. So, I mean, it must have been an incredible experience, you know, documenting this in the film. What did you learn most from making that movie? Wow. Um, I almost feel like that's a question that, you know, has, could be answered in so many different realms. You know, what did I learn about the sport? What did I learn about my myself on a private journey? You know, I, I mean, I, I could, what did I learn as a filmmaker? You know, there are so many areas, but I will say this. I think the one, the one answer that kind of covers that entire or blankets all of those aspects is the most powerful thing that I learned in making this film is that we are all capable of creating change. I'm not an Olympic gold medalist. I'm not famous. I'm not wealthy. I don't have these elements that so many people associate with creating change, right? You have to be some big name to make something happen. And I wasn't those things and I'm, I'm still not, <laughs> but the fact that I could do it and the reason that it was successful and happening was because I partnered up with other people who felt the same way. And together we, like you mentioned the sledgehammer effect, instead of me just being one sledgehammer trying to change, change everything by, by smashing it to pieces, I found other sledgehammers and then we could do a lot more damage in a good way. <laughs> and that is really the, the main thing that I learned was we're all capable of, of aligning with the right people, finding, you know, your tribe of people who get what it is that you're trying to do and they stand by you and they become a voice themselves. And the other part of this equation that was so interesting for me is learning that we all should be asking for what it is that we want to, to see happen. So instead of saying something like, well, why aren't there women in the Tour de France or why aren't we seeing women cycling on TV? Change that around and say, instead of asking why, let's ask for it. Let's ask the networks, and I mean this very literally, call, write, email, use social media to ask these places that have that power of control, ask to see women's sports on TV. And the more people, the more sledgehammers we have asking away, <laughs> that's where the change comes from. And that's, that's the most important thing that I, I have learned. You know, we wanted a tour to France. We asked people for signatures of support on a petition and we got it. So um, utilizing the ability to ask is something I think we, we lose touch with a lot in, in our lives. So if there's a way to gain that back, I would say... You know, ask for what you want, but make sure if you're a leader of this kind of change that you are ready to give as much as you're asking for. Absolutely. I mean, you couldn't see me, but I was like nodding my head. I was like, yes, 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 because we are all ca capable of creating that change. I actually wrote a blog article about 55 ways that, that women can change the world. And it's exactly like you said, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a gold medalist. You don't have to be a named person. You don't have to be rich because every single individual has power and it is literally calling the TV stations up. It is writing letters. It is sending emails. It's using the power of social media are you supporting other women are you following them are you retweeting them are you buying their books if they've written books about adventure or sports or anything are we supporting what we want to see and everyone can take those actions I mean a key one for me was I went to an Women in Adventure Expo in, in Bristol and it was supported by a company called Low Alpine. And I thought, and I know how difficult it was for the, for, for the Women in Adventure to get sponsorship. And that made me really reflect on, okay, well now Low Alpine, they have put their money in their pocket and they've supported this event. They're supporting women in adventure and doing challenges. Therefore, I want to support them. I want to go and look at their products. And, you know, if they're the products that I need to buy that's where I'm going to invest my money and I think if more women was you know really uh, took it down to that level you can 
absolutely create change i think um i'm so behind you like 100 percent on all of this we could end up talking for the next hour about sort of like activism and just like making change happen it's about asking for it it's not about it's not about sitting back and saying and just complaining so well why you know well why aren't women in the tour de france or why why aren't women paid the same amount as as men and and why aren't it? it's like well what can we do to change it it's, it's almost right. changing our our attitude towards it so yeah absolutely a fantastic loving all of your activism work and everything else sounds sounds amazing oh I'm almost like all out talk (laughs) Sarah no that's great and you you touched on something very important too which is women women really need to support other women and I think we're doing a better job of that all around in our society but man I still run into it sometimes where I don't know whether it's a competitive element or a way that some women are raised. They're not always as supportive of other women. There's more of a competitive element or something strange. I can't put my finger on it exactly, but uh, that's something we should, we should always kind of be aware of and try to, you know, educate and help people that might stumble over that area in life. But to really, you know, uh, be supportive. Women supporting other women is something we just need more of. Absolutely. Well, I used to work in banking and mm-hmm. I found that, you know, very competitive environment and I became very competitive and yeah. it's, and it, and it was more about the competition than the collaboration. And you get used to being surrounded by, by women who, you know, unfortunately they will stab you in the back and it's quite a ruthless place to be. Whereas now I'm out of that arena. What I found, especially doing what I'm doing, you know, speaking to, to all these amazing women who've done these incredible challenges. And it is all about collaboration. It's about sharing, sharing that knowledge and supporting other women. So I a hundred percent agree with that. So you have written a number of different books. Um, (laughs) Yes. Yes. Three. (laughs) <laughs> which is um which book are you sort of uh, most proud of or is are you proud obviously you're proud of them all but which one really sort of stands out for you oh thank you I you know what I guess they're all you know in a way for a writer to look at their books you know I guess they're like children they each have their own different unique elements <laughs> and we're supposed to love them all so um I you know my first book all the Sundays yet to come was a memoir from my figure skating days so very different from my second book, As Good as Gold, which was about the Olympic journey that we touched on earlier in the podcast. And then the third book is an essay collection called The Road Less Taken. And that one is about basically the my time as a professional cyclist, you know, up to uh, 2014. So, and that style being a little different, it, you know, being an essay collection, it's little snippets rather than a collective narrative. So there are three very different topics, very different books, but I guess, I mean, I'm just lucky to have anything published, <laughs> but I'm proud of the collective journey that they, they represent, you know, um, going from various different points in my life. But also, even though I might be the main protagonist in these nonfiction slash memoir slash essay collections, what I've tried to do is use my experiences to project a larger light on a bigger topic or, you know, something that is seen as educational rather than me, me, me. So I'm hopeful that that is something that comes across in the books. And if maybe if I had to be proud of something, I'm hopeful that that's the, the element. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. So you left professional cycling in 2014. Um, What have you been doing since then? Actually, I'm still a professional cyclist. So my first, yeah, my first season as a pro racer was 2012. And this will be my fifth and final year racing professionally. I will be racing for a team called Silence Pro Cycling. Uh, It's based in the US, but we have a number of international riders. And I will retire at the end of the season, you know, the end of the summer and ready for, you know, the next chapter of my life. But I really, really am grateful for this last chance and this world tour level team to to race for them and to kind of give everything I have for the next 10 months and then, you know, wave and smile and say, okay, goodbye. And then, (laughs) but not really goodbye, more of like a transition into a role so that I can keep being an activist, you know, and keep fighting for, for the change that we need both in cycling and all sorts of areas. 
really. Absolutely. So your fifth and final season as a professional cyclist, can you just give some insight into your training and what you focus on? I can tell you a little bit about the training, you know, especially right now in the winter, you know, so we start racing. It's a very, very early calendar. We're going to be starting in late January, early February, especially with it being an Olympic year. It's going to be very, very full blast. Everybody is on form and on point very early. So for me also being 40 years old now, I've had to to tailor my training to what works for, for me at this point in my life. I have a very good base of endurance underneath me. So what I need to concentrate on is the, the sharpness of, of speed, making sure that I'm at the top of my game for the intensity side of the sport. I would say right now I train between 15 and 20 hours a week. And, you know, a few of those are some gym sessions to work on weights, lifting, making sure everything is strong. And the rest of the time is on the road. So, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week right now. And then, of course, as we get into the racing season, then it's it's more about racing and making sure you're recovered for the next race, rested and recovered. So it's quite a juggling game. <laughs> Absolutely. I was going to ask you about the rest and the recovery, because this is something yeah. that that I'm sort of I've I've struggled with previously and it's something that doesn't really get talked about a lot is is like the overtraining that can happen how do you properly rest and recover what are your what's your advice around that my my first element of advice is you have to stop being so neurotic <laughs> <laughs> Not you personally, Sarah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, because it's so drilled into us and drilled into our culture. Like, well, if you're not, if you're not working hard and if it doesn't hurt, you're not making progress and moving forward. And the opposite is true. I actually had a coach a few years ago who said something that really rings true. And he said, you're only as good as your rest. And it's so true. If we're not rested, we're going to be burnt out. We're going to go into what's called the hole of, you know, exhaustion or fatigue or sickness, illness, injury, all of that. So if we stop and remember that we're only as good as we are well rested, then it really makes sense. So I think in the past couple years too, being a little bit older, I've been able to figure out what workouts what they do to me, right? So if I go out for a five or a six hour long winter training ride, do I need a little bit extra recovery time from that now that I'm a little bit older? Because it turns out last year, you know, at 39 slash 40, I had my best season ever. And I think the only reason that that is, is because I've wisened up to listen to my body. And sometimes every now and then I need an extra rest day that maybe a 25 year old doesn't need, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm a, I'm a slower or quote unquote worse athlete. It actually means I'm listening to my body and I'll be better for it in the long run. So that's, that's the one thing that I want to make sure that all athletes, especially those who are over, over 30 really understand is, uh, you know, your body best and resting, resting and laziness are two totally different things. So always, always rest when, when you feel that you need it and you might be surprised at how much more you can give, you know, the next day when you really want to push a workout to to its limits. Absolutely. I think that's really interesting, um, the resting and laziness, because sometimes, uh, you know, you do feel a little bit lazy and you just, you know, you're nice and snug in your bed and and you look outside, especially in the UK, it's raining, it's howling out there and you're thinking, I really should go for a run. And then part of my brain sort of says, oh, but Sarah, you need the rest, you need the rest, maybe you shouldn't do it. So it is about, about getting that balance right. I was going to ask you about women and endurance. Because women, or or it seems to me from the ladies that I've spoken to, that women actually get better as they get older at endurance sports. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more, but it's not just about me agreeing. It's about science agreeing. And you'll see, if, if you check out Half the Road, you'll see we include a segment in there on exercise physiology. And we have a physiologist that talks to exactly that level of saying that basically women's physiology is geared more toward endurance than men's. So let's say we, we can use the example of the marathon, right? Right now in this day and age, men are about 12 minutes faster than women at the very, very top level, right? Mm-hmm. 
And what's interesting is they've done studies where they say, okay, well, that's at the marathon level. What if we make it longer? What about a 50-mile run? Or what about a 100-mile run? Then what happens, right? So they've tested these theories. And the longer that they make a distance, the shorter the gap is between the male and female finishers. So that just goes to show that endurance is on the women's side in terms of, you know, the ability to to last longer. So if we look at that then in terms of age as well, we can look at something like the Olympic time trial, which for the last two Olympics, the US's Kristen Armstrong has won those those last two gold medals and she was the last one she was 39 years old. And this year going into Rio, let's see, Emma Pooley's coming back. Kristen Armstrong's going to be there at 43. So we're talking about an amazing ability for female athletes to to push their limit at something of the endurance sports. It is true that as you know, the faster twitch muscles, so like sprinting, that will usually favor the younger athletes. But the older the athlete, the more endurance is on their side. So, you know, yay for us. (laughs) No, absolutely. I think it's amazing because so many women almost think, well, I'm too young, so I can't do that. Or I'm too old, so I can't do that. And it's just like age is but a number. It it does not matter at all. It it really is. That's just society's brainwashing. (laughs) You know, that's all it is, is society saying, oh, you're too old. You're this, you're that, you're the other thing. And and maybe it's perpetuated by the fact that, say, somebody who wants to try to get into shape, maybe for the first time in their life, or maybe they've just been away from sports for a while, maybe when they're older, it's going to take them a little bit longer to get back into the kind of shape that they need to be in. And so therefore, they feel defeated, like, oh... It's never going to happen. It's this and that. No, no, no. It'll happen. You just have to get the ball rolling. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's about that consistency as well. Um, sure. I, I, I mentioned this. My mum hates mentioning it, but I encourage my mum to um, to come and do weightlifting with me. And um, and she's in her 60s and she can do a pull-up, which, you know, an unassisted pull-up. And I'm just that's like, that's awesome. That's what I said. I, 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 I tell everybody because I'm so proud. I'm like, yeah, my mom could do a pull up. <laughs> it's like, that is so great. I'm with you. My dad and I go to the gym and he's pushing 80 and he goes and he does his stuff and I do my stuff and it's awesome. You can do whatever it is that you want to do at any age. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Oh my goodness. You, you're an athlete, you're an author, you're an activist. So next year or, um, this will be released in 2016. You've Great. got t- 10 more months left of um, prof- professional road cycling. You're going to continue with your activism, which is fantastic. And I'm going to be supporting you 100% because I also want to see more women's road cycling on the TV and in the news and and women cycling in the Tour de France. Have you got any other big challenges or big dreams that you haven't done yet that you'd like to do in the future? <laughs> Oh, that's such a great question, Sarah. First of all, thank you for all the support. You know, really, honestly, my biggest dream is to be in a position where I can help give back, you know, so if I can get to that level where I can, I can give back, not just in terms of the activism, but if, you know, in the financial regard to the stuff that we need to bring around change, that would be fantastic. So what I'm hopeful that I can do is keep writing books and keep making films that uh, educate the masses. And maybe from there, we can continue to push the progress forward. So all of that. And then I'm just trying to also always remember like, okay, I'm happy, you know, I have to be happy right now too. That's a part of the journey that we often overlook. So kind of that self-awareness of of making sure that I'm enjoying the ride as it goes. <laughs> Always a challenge, but so far it's working. I was speaking with somebody else today about happiness and about being present and being in the moment and trying to live for live for now and she said something great to me she said it's almost it's almost about giving yourself permission it's okay to be happy (laughs) which seems so true it is but it seems it seems quite it seems quite silly because I think I don't know I massively chased perfectionism for so long you know I wanted to be perfect at everything and it's only when you really think about it and you realize that is never going to happen so or you almost just need to <laughs> let that go and just yep. realize it is okay you can be happy even if you haven't even if you had a list of 10 things to do and you only right. did eight of them 
be happy that you've done eight and don't beat yourself up because you haven't done the full 10. So exactly, especially, and I got to add to that too, you know, we're all human beings and we all go through crappy times. So the last thing I ever try to preach is like, oh, you got to be happy all the time. Got to love the whole journey. No, there are days that are just going to plain suck. And that's okay is more the message that I try to put out there. It's like sometimes life throws stuff your way that is not okay and it's not good and it hurts and it's painful. And, you know, we're all human. So know that when that stuff comes up, deal, deal with that, do what you need to do so that you can get back to being happy. But it's better to honor how you're really feeling than put on like a a fake happy face. So really be true to who you are. And if you're going through tough times, just try to remember it will get better, but don't, don't force the happy, just be who you are and, and it'll come around. Be who you are and who you are being is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing your your life as an athlete, the books you've written, the activism and what you're achieving. And it is so fantastic. It's actually brilliant to hear. I will be putting the links to your website, to your Facebook, to your Twitter on toughgirlchallenges.com. And if you just want to share your Twitter handle now, that would be great. Sure. It's at Catherine Bertine and it's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-B-E-R-T-I-N-E. And you can follow Half the Road too. That's the film. So thank you, Sarah. I'm so honored to be a tough girl. Absolutely brilliant speaking with you. And do send Catherine a tweet. Also send me a tweet if you've listened to this episode and you feel inspired. I know I do. My Twitter handle is Sarah Williams at tough underscore girl all in capitals. Catherine, a massive thank you to you and please continue doing the fantastic work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Sarah. You too. You're doing awesome. What a fantastic episode. I thoroughly enjoyed recording that and speaking with Catherine. What an inspiration. What a woman. What she's doing is just absolutely awesome. There's also another woman out there called Jo Molesley who is doing something fantastic. She's just set up a new website called healthyhappy50.com and it's for ladies out there who are over the age of 50 and thinking actually, do you know what, they want to get sporty, they want to get fit, they want to get active. If that is you, go and check it out. So well done for Jo for setting that up. I just want to say a couple of the blog posts I mentioned are, are available on toughgirlchallenges.com. So I talked about 55 ways women can change the world. It's a fantastic list of different ideas that you can try out of things that you can personally do to make an impact. I also actually share a blog post that I wrote about my battle with trying to be perfect and how I am struggling to let go of my perfectionist tendencies that I have, but I am working hard on getting rid of that. So they're all on toughgirlchallenges.com on the blog. So go and check it out there. And you can see about the other things that I've been writing about, such as my training. As you may know, I'm now in Melbourne, which has been absolutely insane. The weather is incredible. So I'm sorry for everybody who's listening in the UK and it's cold and it's miserable but I am in 30 degree plus heat and I'm absolutely loving it. Training's going really well. I've had a few issues as I did break my little toe. I got a blister and then I got a blister on top of my blister, so a double blister. Um, Also got sunburn because I forgot to put sunscreen on the back of my leg. So a whole host of different issues, but the running has been great. It's just been fantastic just getting outside and doing my training and knowing that the sun is going to be shining. It makes a massive difference to me. Now, I normally, I am all about women and supporting women, but I do want to give a shout out to some of my regular male listeners who have been incredibly supportive of what I'm doing with Tough Girl Challenges. So a massive thank you to Yanni Lunga, to Steve Bonthrone, Chris Cunningham, Jack Clover, James Yearsley, and Stuart Griffiths. You've all been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for your support. Now, we did talk about having your tribe, and I do have a Facebook group which is called the tough girl tribe and it's for the women for the listeners of the tough girl podcast who want to connect with other women to talk about their challenges to talk about the you know their goals for the year to talk about their training you know what they're doing and to find that place so they can come and get support or just come and have other people say to them oh my god you've signed up for this multi-stage endurance race you're not crazy 
it's absolutely fantastic and you can do it if you put your mind to it so if that sounds like you then come along come and join the tribe it's a closed facebook group i don't mention it anywhere else apart from on here so if you just search under groups tough girl tribe you will come and find us just to say a massive thank you again to everybody who's been listening please do subscribe to the podcast if you're enjoying what you're hearing then please do leave a five star review on iTunes because it will help with the ranking and that means that more people will find out about the Tough Girl podcast. If I could ask you to do one thing this week is tell a friend about the Tough Girl podcast, share an episode with them, get them to listen to it and let's help spread these incredible stories and help support other women out there. Have a fantastic week. I will be with you next Tuesday. I'll speak to you then. Take care. Bye-bye.